Well, this is the very last of our fun-filled trilogy on Satan. Satan. Boy, it's great to see you all jump. It means you're awake. I thought I was hard at <laughs> No, I am. That's why I can yell like that. Wax bill up. Anyway, here's the trick, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight, we will close up our consideration of the Prince of Darkness. Now, uh, the first of these talks that we gave, if you recall, was Satan, not so obviously. <laughs> Satan subtle. Yeah. The second was... Satan light. Satan light, that's right. <laughs> the second was classic Satan. <laughs> Satan in your face, so to speak. Oh, hi. That was, uh, that was our uh, second talk. Tonight, we're going to basically clear, uh, finish talking about a few things. Um, we talked about spiritualism last time, didn't we? Mm -hmm. We uh, talked a bit about magic. We talked about all that kind of stuff. Well, we've got a few things like voodoo and all that to talk about tonight. And then we've got to say bye-bye uh, to Satan and sum it all up. That's what's going to go on tonight. So for starters, there is a woman of my acquaintance who wore a folk charm, an Italian folk charm, against the evil eye. Now, yeah, there's a little gold thing. The little gold thing. Now there's an important there's an important point to be made here. In that, in that there is such a thing that people generally call the anthropologists and people of that sort folk Catholicism. Now, folk Catholicism differs from dogmatic Catholicism or parish Catholicism as we know it in what way? Well, for one thing, it doesn't cost nearly as much. But also... <laughs> also is, is there a Novus Ordo folk Catholicism? Uh, not really. Not really. It's, it's a funny thing. There, there isn't it's, much of a Novus Ordo folk Catholicism. It's very traditional. Yeah, it is. Because folk Catholicism really is simply the natural response, get this now, the natural response of a relatively uncorrupted population, and by this I don't mean morally, but mentally. They can be morally quite as corrupt as anyone. If um, anyone ever, said, uh, ever listened to a whole bunch of old peasant women sitting around discussing abortions via herbs, you know that the uh, dear sweet peasantry can be pretty corrupt. But, but, not morally uncorrupted, mentally uncorrupted. The response of such a people to the simple facts of Catholicism. I mean, you have to bear in mind what the life of the average European peasant was up into this century. And in places like the Philippines and Latin America, and even some remote parts of Europe, like Sicily and Brittany and all that today. It was a life that was not, how do I put it? It was not filled with television. There, the truth is out. Well, they didn't have much electricity. Not much in the way of books. Or public transportation. No, no, no <laughs> boats, no cars, no boats, no motor cars. Not a single luxury. Like Robinson Crusoe, they were primitive as can be. That's right, and that that was the way they uh, that was the way they lived. That was the way they lived, and in such an existence, they were aware of certain things that we are not. The impossibility, for instance, of banishing the night. When night fell, the peasant of old Europe, as was, as the great lord, as the churchman in his monastery, was at the mercy of whatever crawled in the darkness. The little can most people went to bed with sundown, because uh, you know candles and all. <laughs> there wasn't much else. There wasn't to do. much else to do. Candles yeah. were expensive, and staying up at night was a bit frightening. So they went to bed. Hey, you know, recently uh, I was flying from here to St. Louis, and it was nighttime, and I was looking out the plane window, and I was noticing that for vast parts of this country of ours, when you look down at it at night, there's nothing there. It's just nothing. But then you'll have a city come into view, and you see all this bright light, this, and then it goes by, and then you're back to nothing again. It's just blackness. And before electricity, the city would have looked just like the rest because even with torchlights in the streets, they don't brighten the thing up enough that you can see it from a, from a plane. So uh, if you were to somehow you know, time warp back 200 years and fly over even Europe, even populated parts of Europe, you would see very little light. Now, the, concomitant with, the, with the, the overwhelming force of the night was the ever-present fear of plague. Now, 
we to this day, despite the fact that we've got penicillin and uh, what else? We've got aspirin. We've got some other stuff. Antibiotics. Antibiotics. We've got all these things. Nevertheless, time after time, we get these little plagues that we can't really deal with. I mean, imagine if we had something like Ebola break out here. Ha, ha, ha. In a downtown population. Where did Legionnaire's disease come from? Where does AIDS come from? Everyone guesses, but no one knows, really. Well, imagine that everything is virtually untreatable to our way of thinking. Well, and also, they don't have any understanding even of the mechanism. No. They did not understand germs and bacteria and all of that. So it was just this mysterious thing. It just came up. That passed from house to house. And, and left some people alone because they didn't understand about immunity either. Plague had passed through a town or a village. Everybody gets wiped out except eight or nine people. Well, uh, why are those eight or nine people spared? They don't know. Of course, I'll tell you a little secret. As with everything else, we would say, oh, well, they're immune. <laughs> why? A disease that has never existed in the area before comes up, and eight or nine of these people, chosen at random from among the studio audience, are immune. The difference is, and this is where you see a lot of our fallacies, we really don't know that much more in a lot of ways than they did. The difference is because we have words to describe things, we're not, you could say, as frightened or be as aware of the reality of the situation. Two ways of looking at it. Now similarly, because we have expanded means of transportation at our disposal, we do not fear famine the way they did. We are not dependent upon a single crop in our little town here. If the crop of potatoes goes bad, we die. We don't live like that. If the crop of potatoes fails here, not a problem. 747s and, and uh, well not 747s and our transports, but uh, transport planes and, and railroad cars and trucks will rush in potatoes from Iowa. Of course, you do hear the wailing and gnashing of angry uh, shoppers at Ralph's when uh, lettuce is up to two or three dollars, and, and for a kind of withered yeah. variety as well. Yeah, you, you will guide me people to get upset, but you know, I've but noticed, it's not as if they're going to go without anything. I've noticed that a one sauce. You know, when I was a kid, it used to be real thick, uh -huh. and you had to just work at it. <laughs> now it just runs out. I mean, this is one of my major pains in life. The way a one sauce has gone. Now, these are the difficulties of the flick. Uh, As A1, so goes the world. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. It's like, like A1, it's gotten weak and watery. <laughs> but, you see, these are our problems. But for them, a crop failure meant the end. A crop failure meant the end. Now, there are still crop failures. We don't notice the effect because we don't live in parts of the world where they still live that way. And because when it happens here, our means of transportation are such that we can, we can take care of it pretty quickly. Similarly, they were dependent upon the seasons. In the summer, you get fruits and green vegetables. Winter, you get root vegetables. And you'd be very happy to have them, if you have them. Uh, same with livestock. You know, We raise chickens of these miserable, miserable pens where we've got millions of chickens crammed in together. And they can't lead a life that's full and rich in chicken terms. But the result of this is that there's cheap chicken for everybody. See? You didn't have that when they were all free-range and organic. Chickens were expensive. There's the old saying in New England, you know, that the old Yankee farmers, they, don't eat, they only taste chicken when either they, they were sick or the chicken was sick. And that, uh, let, me, let me tell you, the chicken wouldn't get a recover. <laughs> they might, the chicken would. Gosh, can you imagine a chicken eye, a chicken eye view of reality? <laughs> it's plagues, zooks. But no, this this was a. This Is A1 was, sauce good on chicken? Uh, it can be. Yeah, it can okay. be. You can barbecue it. All right. But anyway, what we're getting at. Is that. Is that. Uh, we may say we understand these things and have a grip on them and all of that. The fact is, we don't really know. We don't really know. As I've mentioned this before, uh, I teach a highly technical <clears throat> class with large vocabulary words and all kinds of drawings on the board um, having to do with recording sciences. And uh, 
when it gets down to uh, trying to explain how a microphone like this one here works, we're down to the problem of the, sa the, the vibrations from my voice are moving a diaphragm in here, which is moving a copper coil around inside a magnetic field, and this generates fluctuating electrical currents. Now, I can say all that, I can prove that it happens, but if you're going to try to get me to explain to you what electricity is, I can't do it. I mean, there's a working definition of a stream of moving electrons, all right, but since we don't even really know what electrons are, nor what constitutes a stream of them, we know how to control it somewhat, we know how to direct it, but it's still a matter of you take a copper coil and you move it around in a magnetic field and electricity results. All right, so we don't really know how things work. We know that they work. We've harnessed them, but we don't know what they are. We have technique. We don't have knowledge. It's a big difference. And so it's true that people don't get wiped out by smallpox anymore. But you know what? Everybody will still die. There's no protection against death. You could delay particular cases, but you can't stave it off. We don't, uh, it's true that we don't worry about famine, thanks to our means of transport. But you know something funny? I remember the 71 quake, <laughs> and we were without water for three days. And I tell you what, no electricity, no gas, no nothing. And for moderns, it's, it's really difficult doing that. Oh, but that's okay. We have teams of psychologists waiting in the wings to come in and help people with earth, earthquake uh, trauma. Oh, that's so true. That is so true. Oh, and every time... You know, every time there's a shooting at a school. Yeah, they have the psychologists come in and they, they teach the kids how to deal with life. When you consider a few hundred years ago, you know, kids were dying right and left from all kinds of things. All kinds of infections. You know, did they have psychologists waiting in the wings to help the kids get over the trauma? They did. They had these counseling teams who would go into <laughs> plague-stricken areas, and if they survived, they... Anyway, no, it's, it's, it's very true. And the... the, the uh, oh, and of course, of course, it's off the track, but we can't get married without Cana oh. conferences. Gee, this isn't special pleading. Uh, no, yes, yes, well... But, uh, <laughs> I'll tell you. No, but it's true. How, how did people get by in the bad old days before they had these things? And, you, you know, I, I was just thinking, again, this is a, a personal memory, but it shows you what privation, what depths privation will reduce moderns to. Uh, I remember at the time of the earthquake, my dad went down to buy water. There was no water at all. It had already been bought out because in true Coulomb fashion, of course, you know, we, we took our time getting there. <laughs> Relax, and then decide we'd go, and you know, we got down there. And what there, there wasn't any water left at all, but what there was lots of was Gatorade. <laughs> so... We drank Gatorade for three days. And we didn't just drink Gatorade. We cooked soup in it. <laughs> Never lived until you had Campbell's stock pot made with Gatorade. Mm, mm, good. That's what Campbell's soups can be. And we had we made tea Gatorade. Gatorade tea is sort of interesting. Ever have a bag of Lipton's in hot Gatorade? I tell you what, it, it, I, before the quake, I loved that stuff. But I, I, I lost my taste for it after three days of Gatorade and everything. Um, we had Gatorade and milk, even. and not milk. I'm sorry, I'm over the cereal. We had no milk. We had it over cereal. Uh, we, we, had, we didn't wash it. We had our limits. But these are the depths that moderns can be reduced to. And if anyone thinks I'm going out afterwards for a glass of Gatorade, you're nuts. I can't touch the stuff now. But anyway, I, I can okay. vividly remember the taste. Anyway, moving right along. Uh, folk Catholicism. Folk Catholicism. The point is that <laughs> folk Catholicism. <laughs> there was a point. Hey, we're getting there. We're getting there. Relax. Don't be impatient. Considering how I had to wait for you folks to get settled this evening, you'll relax if I get off the ta the tack of it. As I was saying, uh, the fact of the matter is, is that folk Catholicism, then, arises from a direct apprehension of spiritual reality on the part of people who are not mentally unable to comprehend it. So you see, they knew that when there was plague, or famine, or flood, or fire, that somehow or other there were demons involved. 
That's why during great storms, they'd ring the church bells, you see, to drive off the demons behind the storm. And on many and many a European church bell, and even a few American ones, it says, I call, I call the living, I toll for the dead, I break the storm, I drive out demons. Now, similarly, you know Candlemas? The Feast of Candlemas coming up? In uh, many, 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 many places around the world. Louisiana comes to mind, but there are other places that were much given to storms and hurricanes and things like that where Catholics live. Whenever there was a storm and there was no way for them to seek any sort of refuge, they would take the blessed candle they'd gotten at Candlemas and light it. They'd light it whenever there was any kind of threat to the family. Because you see those blessed candles with a light that shone in darkness. Uh, sacramentals of all sorts. Holy water. Oh boy, oh boy, people use these. Now, you remember last time we spoke about witchcraft? A great part of folk Catholicism dealt with repelling the evils of witchcraft. Now, again, remember you've got a sort of village community. It's very... I mean, there are parts that we would find very pleasant. There are parts we would find awful. Pleasant parts, you can guess. It's a real sense of community. They celebrate the church year. Every, almost everyone, well, no, every, virtually everyone, except perhaps the priest, believes the faith completely. But, but, there'll be somebody in that village who's ill-favored. Perhaps doesn't like the villagers, and they don't like it. They don't like them. You know, part of the problem with these small villages is that you get a role early in life, and you stay there your whole life long in that particular role. The village idiot, of course, generally got elected to Congress after they had a republic in that country. But the uh, you have all of these people. You know, the, the village uh, not the the village gossips, the village this, the village that, uh, and you stay in those roles forever. I'll just say parenthetically. So. The, the Coulombs descended from the village drunks, right? That's a, no. <laughs> no, thank you very much. We descended from the Lord of the Manor. Wow. If he was a drunk, no one noticed it. That's I, what God I, made I, gates for. I, I, <laughs> but at any rate, although there would be a village drunk, and yet he was accepted as that. It's good and bad. Yeah. You never get over being a village drunk, but on the other hand, people didn't mind. You know, yeah, They expected to have one. And... Exactly. Oh, there's old Francois, the village drunk. Give him a, give him a bottle and send him off. But the thing is, uh, uh, the same is true today. You know how they say in small towns, everybody knows everybody's business. Well, that's good and that's bad. You hear people at the same time talk about how anonymous the city is. Nobody knows anyone and so on. Well, that's bad and that's good. <laughs> I had some friends, uh, still do it, fat, who were contemplating moving to, um, well, I don't want to say where, it was either Post Falls or St. Mary's, uh, or both. And they were thinking very, very seriously about moving there. But it struck them that if they did move there, those would be the only people they could socialize with. And that, because these are a couple of, shall we say, uh, very, not, they're, they're, they're good Catholics, but they're, you know, they like to joke, they like to talk, they like to debate, they, you know. They're, they're unconventional, shall we say. Uh, it struck them that they would find life there very unpleasant in short order. Here, in the city, if you uh, get disgusted with a group of people, you can sort of put them on the shelf and deal with somebody else until it all blows over. Can't do that in the countryside. And it was even more so in the pre-industrial era. So the village wise woman, or wise man, and the village witch were two stock characters also. The wise woman or wise man knew how to heal things. Obviously not brain tumors, but other things. In uh, French Canada, you know, we had people we called traitiers, which means literally treaters. And these are folk who, um, well, I, I know one woman up in the St. John's Valley of Maine who could cure a ringworm by rubbing her spit on it. How'd she do it? I don't know. Did she do it? Yes. I really don't know how it was done. Now, then you had the village witch who it was rumored it had given herself up to the forces of evil in return for powers. Now, mind you, we're talking about a pretty low, low rank on the totem pole here. Well, to guard themselves against such people, the, the villagers of yore would come up with all sorts of things, including things like the charm, 
<laughs> on the woman I spoke of earlier. <laughs> <laughs> you mean like this? Yeah, yeah, like, hell yeah. Everyone <laughs> starts pulling them out, you know. These, <laughs> oh, I've got my carrot root right here. And everyone's, <laughs> what is that? <laughs> Folk Catholicism isn't dead. <laughs> it's alive and living, folks. <laughs> The door, the door bursts open, and in comes the village witch. You are talking about me, Mister? <laughs> no. So see, it's as we said: the old realities continue despite everything. Well, uh, that that little charm that she was wearing was worn to ward off the evil eye. It did too. <laughs> now, now, now. Hold it. Let's define the evil eye for those of us, for those out there who don't know what those the evil in radio eye is. land. Well, the evil eye is the, the notion that if certain ill-favored people stare at something for a good long time, they can, if it's a lie, they can cause it to sicken and die, whether it be a child, a chicken, or a cow. And one of the things you get in a lot of Catholic folk cultures is the notion of not praising something in public for fear you'll catch the attention of somebody with the evil eye. So, for instance, you don't say, oh, gee, that's a wonderful beard you've got there, Bill. For fear that someone looking who has the evil eye will look, and you know the next thing you know, it withers off, and that's the end of his beard. Uh, this, well, yeah, I'd be horrified. <laughs> well, it was, it was the first one that came to mind. Anyway, the point is that <laughs> that's a fine nose you have there. Carl. <laughs> oh Lord! <laughs> Great hands! <laughs> 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 Now, when you were doing this back and forth to each other, the real question is, who's got the evil eye in this room? I'd look carefully around. Who's doing it? But that's the thing. So you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't draw attention to yourself that way. Uh, there were all sorts of questions like that. The fairies, this kind of thing. Now, what happens when modern Catholics come into contact with some of these folk beliefs that still survive are that they t are often very disturbed by them. Now, see, I'm setting all this up because we're going to go into voodoo for a minute, in, in a minute, and the border, the border can get really strange. That's why I've got to lay down a pretty good understanding of what folk Catholicism is. Now, in Ireland and France and many other places, uh, you'll find that uh, various deeply pious Catholics have all sorts of interesting beliefs in magic and witchcraft and the fairies and all this other kind of thing we've been going over. Uh, <coughs> does the fact that it's believed by Catholics mean that all Catholics are required to believe it? No. Does the fact that they believe this make it untrue? No. And very often what will happen when a, a good modern Catholic comes from New York or L.A. or some other such place and goes to Ireland or Brittany or a mission station in South Africa or wherever. And he comes across some of these things. And there, there are a lot of others, you know, flagellations on Good Friday and things like that. The fellow's repulsed. You know, how could, how could they call themselves Catholic or do this or believe that or think that? Well, the answer is, A, in non-essential things, as we're continually told, liberty. In essential things, unity and all things, charity. So, when one encounters these things, like the penitentes, as I say, in New Mexico, or in the Philippines, or Indonesia, whipping themselves and being crucified non-lethally on Good Friday, it really isn't up to us to turn up our nose at it. Mind you, I wouldn't want to be flagellated. I probably wouldn't want to sleep with a bit of iron under my bed to keep away the fairies. Um, I probably wouldn't wear a little golden locket to keep off the evil eye. But God forbid, I should look askance at anyone else who does. Maybe they know something. I don't. Uh, you know, uh, if you might just shift gears in the same kind of dynamic here. Mm -hmm. uh, I've had this kind of guff from, uh, shall we say, modern Catholics mm -hmm. in relation to scapulars. Isn't that superstition? Sure. Um, uh, lighting candles? Isn't that kind of a heathen thing to do, light candles, to continue the prayer after you've left the room? Isn't that superstitious? Holy water. Don't they use that in vampire movies? Oh, come on. You don't really believe that holy water has any power, do you? Uh, and All these br and miraculous you, and you, prayers. And you want to bring back Latin 
a useless dead language, one that's male centered. And let's, I mean, I mean, let's let's be done with it. All of that, all that old fashioned stuff, Gregorian chant. It's so dull. Don't you realize that that uh, at, at mass we're supposed. <laughs> even if you defend those things on aesthetic grounds, <laughs> even if you defend those things on aesthetic grounds, how do you excuse fairy tales like Fatima and Lourdes and the Sacred Heart and all these these ridiculous apparitions and so on? How could you possibly defend all that? Well, I, yeah, what I'm what I'm pointing out is that you know between the the modern Catholics and us trads, you have this kind of looking down the nose at practices as if they're superstitious. And then, well, how do we say this? Among trads, we have the same down the look, down the nose, looking at other people for their practices. And uh, uh, <laughs> and so it goes. Of course, the, uh, I, I can only imagine what one of these folk Catholics would think of one of our modern Catholics. <laughs> well, you know, it actually hit me once. They, they might look down on their practices like contraception and abortion <laughs> and gay marriages. <laughs> well, I, I'm not thinking of that kind of... <laughs> No, but consider a uh, 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 very good Catholic that uh, that we both know, um, who lives in Texas. Mm. Okay, one time I was talking to him on the phone. Governor and he, Richards. And and he, he, no, and and he said, well, you know, my wife, my wife's mad at Saint Joseph. She's turned all his pictures to the wall again. You know, and 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 this was a few years ago, and I was a little bit not so wise as I am now. And so my question to him was, well, isn't that kind of superstitious to, to turn the uh, your pictures to the wall of, of saints? And he said, no, of course not. The, the, the more real saints are to you, the more you will treat them as though they are real people. And if you're mad at someone you know, what do you do? You tell them you're mad. How do you tell St. Joseph you're mad at him? You turn his picture to the wall. How Stick do you it. tell St. Joseph you're really mad at him? You put his statue in the refrigerator. You know, it's like, <laughs> People do this. They do it. It's, it's a rather common practice to bury a statue of St. Joseph until your house sells. And you see, yeah. you so, see, again, it sounds funny to us. And again, it isn't the sort of thing I do myself. But, you know, in the immortal words of the Jewish tailor, actually, does it work? Actually, I found great satisfaction in yelling yeah. at saints. <laughs> What's really bad is when they yell back. That's how Our Lady of Irwindale got started. You know, the woman was in the quarry and yelled at Our Lady. And, well, yeah. anyway. But that, uh, I have to be careful about Our Lady of Irwindale because we started getting requests for prayer cards. But the uh, uh, <laughs> blessed rocks. But anyway, the thing is that uh, in this area, it gets really, really, really queasy and hazy. All right. Now, keep all of this to one. To one. W would you repeat that maxim about in all things? Oh, uh, in uh, essential things, unity. In non-essential things, uh, liberty. In all things, charity. And that, of course, is the famous dictum of St. Vincent of Lorraine. In and, France, and of course, it's it's assumed to be addressed to Catholics, yeah, not to pantheists and pagans. No, no, and it's, it's within within the fold of the church. Okay, all right, within the fold of the church. Uh, although one would presume that's taken care of in 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 essential things, unity. Uh, of course, again, that presupposes you think faith is important. Maybe it's not. I don't know. God forbid I should impose my views on others. But uh, having said all of that, I now want to turn your attention to. The Botanicas. Now, if you go into various stores uh, in the Spanish-speaking parts of large cities, like, say, oh, I don't know, L.A., you'll come into these very, very interesting shops. On the one hand, they've got the most incredibly graphic and often beautiful, sometimes just gory, uh, pictures of our Lord and our Lady and the saints. They've got tons of prayer, of prayer cards. Beautiful rosaries. Beautiful rosaries. Candles. Candles, medals, and all that. That's on one side. Now, then, on the other side, or interspersed between, you've got the uh, come quick, come quick, yeah, come quick and love me candles, uh, <laughs> money, get over here, spray, hi, John the Conqueror, root, knock my enemy right off his head, bath oil. Uh, you know, and you'll find this stuff sort of cheek by jowl, all mixed together, and it's it's uh, it's quite nice. Uh, I mean. <laughs> You know, some of that stuff, I mean, it's like money come fly to me oil. That's one of my favorites. Well, <laughs> well, 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 well. Then, 
you know, you take it a little bit further. Uh, I remember uh, the uh, uh, friend of mine and I were walking down the street in Miami, Florida. And we come to a crossroads. <laughs> and there was a dead chicken right at the crossroads. A black chicken. And I said to this friend of mine, Santeria, that's what that is. He said, how clever, you knew the chicken's name. <laughs> I, I said, no, no, actually, we weren't acquainted. But, uh, and then you go a little bit further, if you ever see a, uh, a film called The Serpent and the Rainbow, it's about voodoo in Haiti, and it's filled with zombies and all this sort of thing, and yet there are pictures of the saints everywhere, and they kill chickens to them and so on. Well, why, how, what is all of this? What does it all mean? Well, to take it back a little bit further. First and foremost, you know that the gods of the Gentiles are demons. That's from Scripture. All right? Now, back in Africa, the peoples who lived there worshipped many different of the gods. They all, interestingly enough, or almost all the African tribes, believed in a creator god, whom later missionaries were sure was, you know, their memory of the great, you know, of, of the original revelation. But, unfortunately, they were also of the opinion that since he was benign and loves us and all that, uh, either and also he's very far away, either he's too far away to help or he's too loving to have to please. So the people you've got to please are these sort of intermediary deities who demand sacrifices and things. Well, of course, these are the gods of the Gentiles who are demons. Now, when the slaves were brought from Africa to the West Indies, to Brazil, the southern United States. Uh, they brought with them these beliefs. Although, and this is uh, something I've just been doing some research in, it's sort of interesting, and, and of course no one talks about it, because you never like to talk about anything Catholic. But a number of the slaves that were brought over from places like Angola and whatnot were already Catholic when they came into the slave trade. And apparently there was a great deal of evangelization going on purely by the slaves, among slaves. You know, story that, of course, we'll never hear about because none of the people involved could write, and there are just little remnants and bits and pieces of it. But anyway, when they arrived, depending on how well, if they were in Catholic countries, their masters had the obligation by law to teach them the Catholic faith. How well did they teach them the Catholic faith? Well, that varied from master to master, of course. But it was a very easy thing when they came in contact with the saints. And they noticed that various of the saints had attributes that were similar to the gods they had left behind in Africa. For instance, Our Lady Star of the Sea might remind them very much of Yamana, the goddess of the ocean. Things like that. So, what happened? Again, varying wildly from place to place, to a greater or lesser degree, Either they transferred to the given saint the respect that they had had for the uh, deity in Africa, which, if you think about it, is not too dissimilar with what happened with our own ancestors in Europe. It's quite a legitimate thing. Or they might continue to venerate said deity under the guise of venerating the saint. But do you see how delicate that distinction is? And how in the minds of, I would have said uneducated, but of course the uneducated doesn't mean much. In the minds of the simple or easily misled, it could be confused. <coughs> well, the church tolerated a lot of this for the same reason that she tolerated it in Europe and amongst the Indians and so on. Because she knew in her wisdom that as generations of people continue to practice and believe the faith, they become more and more and more Catholic. And that after a while whatever is left of paganry will become like our Christmas trees, or mistletoe, or holly. You know very well when you put up the Christmas tree, you're not venerating for whatever it was people used to do with fir trees. You know, you, you know that. It, it just, it's, it's as much a part of the Christmas celebration as going to Midnight Mass. You, 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 wouldn't, you couldn't imagine it being separated. And that, of course, is what happens in due time. It takes a long time. Okay. Well... A funny thing happened to kind of derail that. Along about the time something called Vatican II came along, the clergy in many, many countries, even here, got into their minds to downgrade the veneration due to the saints and to dismiss it as superstition. 
And that, ladies and gentlemen, was the best possible thing they could have done for Santeria and Voodoo. Because you know, you're a simple person, we'll say. You know that if you pray to St. John the Baptist, for that matter, even if you uh, kill a chicken for him, you know that your prayers will be answered. Then Father Oblivion there at the church tells you, Bah! Prayer to the saints is ridiculous. You know, it's nonsense. Well, A, you know from experience that it works. B, he's telling you it doesn't. So C, how much respect or belief are you going to have in him? Not a great deal. Contrary-wise, along comes this Santero, who says, you know, he's all for the saints. And he says, I could really show you how to make them work for you. Who are you going to believe? Father Oblivion or Honest One? The answer is sort of obvious. And what you have seen, you asked about folk Catholicism and, and uh, you know, the new liturgy and all that. What we tend to see is that folk Catholicism, under the influence of the new regime, particularly in those places that hadn't been evangelized all that long, begins to go back toward paganry. That's what happens. And people revel in bringing out the pagan roots of things. And you see this all over now. It isn't just Wiccans. So, I guess, I guess what you're sort of saying is, is that Catholicism was never taught very well here because it's been our priests and our nuns who've been saying, oh, we should put sand in our wa holy water fonts because that'll bring us closer to the earth. Right. And drivel like that. And again, it's, it's, the, it's these priests and nuns who go to these stupid workshops and all that who come up with that stuff. You know, and all this enculturation. Uh, there's a, a piece I was reading, I don't know if I mentioned this, in uh, Mary Knoll, one of my favorite magazines, um, about this unnatural American <coughs> priest in Korea. And he wanted to introduce a Korean religious custom into the Mass. Well, I forget what it was, but it so happens that that custom was one of the things that their ancestors had been executed for refusing to perform because it was an act of, of devotion to the pagan gods, which they were simply not able to reconcile with Christianity. You know, where the church can reconcile these things, she does, but where she can't, she won't. Or at least she wouldn't and didn't. So this, uh, this American priest says, well, we're going to incorporate doing whatever it is into the Mass now. Well, his Korean assistant and the, and the parish were up in arms. You know, this is pagan. Our ancestors were executed for, for not doing this. And, of course, he had no sensitivity toward that at all. He just, pssst. And he was able to get one of uh, the old people in the uh, parish who was very much respected to go along with it, and so they followed her. <coughs> but you see, you see. Now, here's a question for you, since the topic tonight is really the devil. We know that the accomplishing of ends through uh, recourse to pagan deities is devilish. We know it's an appeal to the demons. We know that uh, some of these Santeros are no more than the village wise man. But we know that others are something much worse. Now, who is worse then? Who or not even worse, but is there a great difference between the Santero who convinces uh, Mama Lucia to, um, you know, kill a chicken to, uh, kill a chicken to, uh, uh, try to think of a name, one of their uh, gods, Legba, or the priest who drove, who drove her away by telling her there was no point dealing with the saints. They both do the devil's work, and they actually operate in tandem. They're in it together, even though they don't know it. But the fellow behind them, he knows it. Has it ever struck you as sort of interesting that when order priests or nuns go bad, they tend to make as their primary focus of attack whatever it was their order was devoted to. If it's a Marian order, They'll downgrade Our Lady. If it's uh, devoted to the Blessed Sacrament, they downgrade the Real Presence, and so it goes. You know, if they were, if they're disciples of uh, Saint Francis, the last one they want anything to do with is Saint Francis. 
and ditto St. Dominic, ditto St. Ignatius, and on it goes. This is the devil at work. And so, when you see the little old lady going off to the Santero, and then burning a sacrifice in front of a picture of a saint, and, and notice that there are pictures of saints that are being used less and less now, and more and more they're using the actual idols. That's kind of interesting. Uh, that is obviously something we can imagine the laughter of Satan. But do save a thought for her parish priest as he sits watching his television, confident that he's driven out yet another bit of superstition from his flock. I assure you, the devil's laughing even louder. But now, so much for voodoo. There's more in our tour of the bazaar. Did we tackle the New Age at all last time? No, but one thing we didn't really finish was the story of the little uh, trinket. Oh, the trinket. Or, or are we going to save that for the end of the whole talk as to what happened to that? I think we should save the trinket woman for the end of the whole talk. The, uh, but don't let's forget it. It's, it's not it's, that big a story, actually. <laughs> all right. The punchline's not that huge. <laughs> well, very, the punchline, then fine, have it your way. A traditional priest who um, knows this one uh, saw her when she knelt to receive communion and was horrified to see this little trinket and demanded that she dispose of it. Now, I know the priest involved is absolutely excellent, but you see again, it comes from a lack of understanding. In non-essentials, charity. I'm sorry, in non-essentials, uh, liberty, rather. I mean, it's kind of obvious, particularly because the priest knew the woman involved, that she certainly wasn't wearing it. Uh, to word off him. Or because <laughs> <laughs> maybe that was the problem. He couldn't get close. <laughs> no, I, 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 I boy, the, the mind shudders. But, um, no, so that, that was the end of that story. I mean, he, he just, he, um, uh, again, it was ill-considered on his part, but it's a trap we can all fall into. That's the problem. It's a trap we can all fall into. So, um, could I just do a little aside here? Sure. You know, uh, sometimes we fear those things which we don't understand. In fact, we often do. Um, I've heard uh, people just offhandedly say things like acupuncture is of the devil. I mean, okay. And if you say, well, why? Well, because it deals with forces that have nothing to do with the Holy Ghost. You know, you mean like a paycheck, pal? Or, you know, and it's like, well, that's that's quite a the the number of assumptions one has to to make that acupuncture is evil because we can't explain it out of the Bible or something like that, or or uh, out of. I mean, if, if anyone here knows anything about it, if you go to a, an authentic Chinese acupuncturist and say, "Would you explain it to me?" Uh, you know, Doctor Chang will say. He'll, he will explain it, and it will make no sense. It'll make no sense in Western terms. And I, I, I even asked one, one such doctor, could, could, does it make sense on your terms? You know, from your side of the ocean, does it make sense? And he said, no. He said, I cannot explain how it works, why it works. All I know is my father taught me how to do this, and it does work. You know. Um, now, to make an assumption that it's evil just because we can't understand it or because it's something that's not mentioned in the Bible or any of these kind of things is an enormous leap. The fact is it works. And the fact is uh, it, 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 it's neither whatever, whatever's being utilized, you know, whatever, whatever healing power there is or whatever, whatever's happening, even the Chinese can't really explain it. It oh. becomes poetic, but it's... Ima imagine that uh, imagine that you were uh, treating something before we knew about the circulation of the blood, which, in order to work, unbeknownst to you, depends upon the circulation of the blood. You don't know that that's why it works, but that's why it works, because you don't know how the human body is put together. Mm -hmm. So, you're treating this person with it, he recovers. Well, obviously, it's witchcraft. He recovered, didn't he? Mm -hmm. And we don't know why he recovered, so obviously, it's of the devil. No. And one day, if you live long enough, you'll live to see them discover the circulation of blood, and then you'll be able to figure out, that's why elevating his feet works. That's it. And what about all the people that said it was of the devil to raise his feet? 
Well, uh, because the feet are the part that touch the ground, therefore they're filthy and disgusting. <laughs> if you lift them up, you're exalting that which is filthy and disgusting, therefore it's of the devil. Well, well <laughs> the a, a, they won't admit they were wrong. B, they'll transfer the same attitudes toward other things. C, they figured it out first, they'll tell you, and you're the one who went against them. Oh, okay. That's how it happens. Okay. But no, it, it uh, and there are an awful lot of things like that. Uh, one thinks in this instance of a, a book called The Unicorn and the Sanctuary. Now, there are some very interesting things in that book and some useful things in that book. But I'll tell you the real kicker. When it comes to the symbolism of the unicorn, the man doesn't know what he's talking about. Because, you see, if you look at his introduction, he says, uh, during the Middle Ages, the unicorn was wrongly held as a symbol of Christ. And he goes on and says it's a symbol of terrible stuff and all that. Well, of course, the first thought is, what does he mean wrongly? Where does he get off? <laughs> I mean to say, if, um, uh, you know, for years and years and years on St. Agnes's Day, uh, people have gone to St. Agnes's Fountain to pray and venerate St. Agnes, even though St. Agnes was never anywhere near there. Uh, who is someone coming along who doesn't know from nothing to say? They are wrongly venerating St. Agnes there. In reality, the reason why the unicorn was seen to represent Christ was twofold. One, because it was held that when you went hunting it, the only thing that could capture a unicorn was a virgin. Because the unicorn, being a very pure beast, could only be attracted to mankind, uh, to, to, to virgin. That is to say, the uh, ultimate in uh, non-corrupted man. And so, this was seen as a type of Our Lord coming to Our Lady. And that only Our Lady alone of all mankind could have attracted, could have brought down, as it were. Could have been a, a fitting temple for the Holy Ghost. Uh, the uh, there are a couple of other reasons, but they escape my mind. That's the that's the, the big one. Now this is an ancient, 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 ancient simile. It goes way, way back. Uh, the unicorn in medieval iconography was always a symbol of good and never a symbol of evil. The fact that the New Agers have adopted him doesn't make him evil. I mean, uh, you know, Reverend Ragbone believes in the Trinity. Does that make the Trinity evil? You know? Uh, all sorts of people venerate the Virgin as the, the feminine side of divinity. Does that make Our Lady evil? I, I hope not. If something can become evil by virtue of the use to, what it's, to which it's put, I assure you there is nothing on earth that is good because there is nothing on earth that cannot be misused. Nothing. Uh, is the priesthood evil? I can point you to a lot of evil priests, but that does not make the priesthood evil. Quite the contrary. It makes its misuse far worse, but it doesn't make the priesthood in itself evil, not by a long shot. The church itself, you know, is misused terribly. Uh, there's nothing on earth that can't be misused. So, the unicorn as a symbol originally represented Christ. Just as we said last time, the pentagram, the five-pointed star inter interconnected, used to represent the five wounds of Christ. The, the fact the, that the witches have it now. The eye in the pyramid represented the Trinity. The fact that the Freemasons use it now doesn't change that. Uh, bingo even was holy once. Well, no, I, I exaggerate slightly. But you know, one one thing is a little bit of knowledge leaves you terrified of everything, and a healthy dose of knowledge uh, makes you humble. Makes you, <laughs> you realize you don't know much. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> but so many things that people are afraid of. If if they knew more about them, they wouldn't be so upset by them. And you that know, like I, like I, I have known people like who would not go into little glass shops because unicorns are very popular yeah you know glass blowers like to make unicorns and because they can make them frilly and put gold fringes on them and i know people that are afraid of of you know even the sight of a unicorn and it's like as you say it if you go back into the symbolism there's nothing to be afraid of so ditto the rainbow i mean just because jesse jackson and the uh, alternatively preferential people 
have misused it so. Remember that the rainbow was supposed to be the sign of God's covenant not to destroy the world again by war. That is what the rainbow means. And we have the word of God himself on it. And if you think I'm going to take the word of Jesse Jackson or the Gay and Lesbian Action Committee over the word of Almighty God, well, you're wrong. You can take it any way you like, but I won't. And it, this sort of thing goes on and on and on. And yet, can't you see the hand of the devil even in making these things the object of horror when in and of themselves... Well, something has to be said, though, and that is that some people prefer to remain horrified. Some people prefer to cling to their myths rather than dispel them. Is, are those like people who enjoy being scandalized? Yeah. Yeah. yeah for example, um, off the track, but similar, similar thing going on. I was trying to explain to a, one of, a, a class of freshmen just last week that <clears throat> uh, there's a general... Uh, uh, impression among older folks that rock and roll is jungle music. Okay, we hear this word jungle music and say, well, why is it called jungle music? Well, haven't you ever seen the old Tarzan movies? Haven't you seen what natives do? They jump up and down. Do you see them waltzing? No. Do you see them doing anything where men and women, no, no. They just jump up and down and do weird things with spears. Okay. Now it's like, when they made those movies, did they go to Africa and actually film tribes dancing? No. They got a bunch of extras, you know, and they put them in front of a camera and said, jump up and down. All right. So in the 50s, when kids saw these Tarzan movies, they said, oh, we're going to be primitive and wicked like them. We're going to jump up and down. All right. Now, were they really connecting with jungle music? No. Have you ever listened to recorded African music? Does it have any connection with rock and roll? No. If you go to a rock concert, how many black people do you see? None. You might see <laughs> might see three. So is there any real connection between rock and roll? No, no, no not the and, ticket man. <laughs> no. Is there any real connection between rock and roll and jungle? No. But it's a myth. And it's a myth that a lot of people have bought into. And a myth that they would prefer to believe rather than to take the effort to find out, well, no, this was just a lot of hype that happened in the United States for a whole bunch of weird reasons. And yes, it's a bunch of kids wanting to be rebellious. But they're not rebelling and they're not fleeing to something that's real. It's just an illusion. It's just an illusion. All right. So, and, and even in a class of 20-year-olds of today, this was upsetting. You, 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 you mean the Rolling Stones aren't aren't doing African music? No. Um, I, they're not. <laughs> they're <laughs> not really doing anything no, with Stones music. <laughs> no, no, matter, no matter what Mick Jagger says he's doing, he's not doing that. You know, uh, another one is rags to riches among, among stars. You know, it, it's poor people struggle up to become very rich people. And the fact is, most people that make it really big start in the middle class. Although, John Lennon, yeah. Mick Jagger... The guys in The Who, Alice Cooper, all these people started middle class. If you start poor, you might make middle class. It's <laughs> you not know, like it come if, off if you start middle class, you have enough money to get to the top. You know, if this you start upset at the them. top, <laughs> you'll go really far. <laughs> or you'll land down at the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's, there, but, uh... but the, the point is, though, that the myths, people are more attached to their myths. They would rather be afraid of these things than learn a little bit and be free of them. But you see, there's, a, there's another thing here, and that is that it, the, the problem with the reality in all of these areas is that it doesn't allow any of us to feel smug. You see, if you could simply look at a thing and simply dismiss it easily enough, the very act of dismissal makes you feel superior. It feeds the ego. I like that. I do too. i got a big ego. It takes a lot of feed. <laughs> but... The problem is that the real situation forces me to admit I don't know, I can be wrong, I need either to uh, check it out or to maintain a noble silence, one or the other, neither of which make me feel good about myself. And of course all the modern religious people tell us that religion is about making you feel good about yourself. Now if ever 
there was something direct from Satan. It's that. If the point of religion were making you feel good about yourself, then, ladies and gentlemen, you wouldn't need Christ. You wouldn't need the sacraments. You'd be so wonderful, you could just sit down surrounded by mirrors and everything would be great. Now, for the liberal, they could be a little more honest because they could say the point of their religion is to make themselves feel good about themselves. For us, we, uh, we follow this more subtle path. Don't know nothing, don't want to know nothing, and I ain't going to learn nothing. Well, again, it makes us feel superior. Uh, the great problem that we've always had with the doctrine, no salvation outside the church. The key to understanding both our religion and the current difficulties we find ourselves in. How many quote-unquote traditional Catholics will simply dismiss it out of hand as Feniac? But it works both ways. Not so much today, but in the days before the indult, I knew more than a few good Feniacs who would dismiss uh, SSPX people and so on as schismatics. And it goes on, you know, you can explore it for yourself. Sooner or later, somewhere or other, you'll find a place where you do it. I'll find a place where I do it. You see. And there is the mark of the devil. Every time you turn around, there he is. Oh. He can't tempt you with, uh, he can't uh, tempt you against chastity? Not to worry. Tempt you against charity. That doesn't do it? I'll find something else. And notice it's not the thing in itself that he cares about. You know, the devil could care less whether or not you're unchaste or proud, so long as you're one or the other, or something equally soul-ruining. Yeah, because either one will get you to hell. Sure, we don't care which, you know. Be, um, be as uh, pure as an angel and as proud as a devil, or as, uh, as humble as an angel and as, uh, as lascivious as a devil. Whichever you, you know, whatever. He doesn't care. He doesn't care. Uh, and, the, and where we really run into problems is with the cavalier dismissal of things. Thinking we don't need to know. Thinking in anything that we've got it all sewn up. You know, in the Middle Ages, they used to say that there were three ways of knowing the truth about anything. The first was revelation. And we know what that is. That's scripture and tradition. It's the only thing we can know for sure in this life. Where the church speaks, I speak. Where the church does not speak, I am silent. I forget who said that, but it epitomizes the reality of things, the way things ought to be. The second means of uh, determining the truth was experience. Now, experience uh, for them could mean anything from history to scientific experimentation to direct experience. This was not as reliable, they felt, as revelation, but it was somewhat more reliable. Then the third was abstraction from the first two, reasoning things out from the first two. Now what we tend to do today is we reverse it. Abstraction is what we think is the most important and the truest means of finding anything out. What somebody tells us, what we heard, what we read. Uh, from what we think up for ourselves. What we think up for ourselves. Our Lady of Irwindale. <laughs> uh, all this kind of stuff. That's what we go in first. Second, not as important is experience. We certainly don't want to know any history. Scientific experimentation, we don't. We we we, we like that so long as it uh, you know backs us up. <laughs> and if it doesn't, well, like with evolution, well, then we'll forget. skip it. Yeah, we'll skip it. You see, I. Uh, but what about genetics? Don't care. <laughs> we evolved. No, but but see, it doesn't. It can't work that way. Yes, it can. It did. All right. Sorry. And then the uh, then the last, of course. The last thing, scripture. Well, no, since it's been dismissed by everything else, why should we hold it? Too. Yeah. How many people do you know? Again, bringing it back to Catholic things, who will take one of these phony revelations over defined dogma, or who will take the Baltimore Catechism or the Catholic Encyclopedia over defined dogma? Tons. Most, Tons. most. I mean, 
it's it's amazing. I, I've been stocking up on blessed grapes for uh, a week and a half now since the date for the Bayside warning came and went. The Bayside warning was the 31st of December, in case you were curious. You saw the great warning that was all around the globe that we all saw? <laughs> where, where did you see it? <laughs> I don't know. If you didn't see it, I'm not telling you. I, I know it was that big ball that landed. <laughs> yeah, on that was the, it. Uh, that Veronica Lukens came out. Yeah. But the the um, no, and the thing is, ever since that day, I've been able to pick up less grapes for a song. <laughs> people have been, <laughs> people have no use for them. But no, uh, and there there. I mean, I, I hate to to uh, it's it's anecdotal, but still, I was talking to one lady who's a great believer in Bayside, and she said, "When the warning comes." Don't go outside. I said, why is that? She said, well, the, the meteor, or the comet, or whatever it is, will suck all the oxygen off the planet. So you've got to stay indoors. <laughs> <laughs> she, I, I take it she lives in an iron lung. Right? I, I hope so. I Very really, shelter. Yeah. I really hope so. I mean, it, 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 just don't go out because you'll suffocate. And, <laughs> and, you know, the thing you've got to understand is this is not a stupid woman. This is a canny businesswoman. You know, who, on anything else, she's really intelligent. But I, I said to her, and I said, uh, <laughs> so I should stay inside because all the air will disappear from outside. And she said, yes, that's right. There won't be any air outside. <laughs> and I, I mean, I, I didn't go all the way. I didn't say, <laughs> the house is supposed to be inside. Where do you think the air in your house comes from? The air conditioner? <laughs> I didn't <laughs> She was not. Oh, she was. You know how I know? You know how I know? A wager was made for an expensive dinner. A wager was made for an expensive dinner. And because we're still here, and because the restaurant is still here, I'm collecting. Is there air inside? <laughs> well, I hope so. At least enough to keep the stakes uh, going. But no, uh, but in, in this, in this flight from reality, the mark of the devil. The mark of the devil. Imagine, let's, let's backtrack for a minute. If denying the truth of the faith can take you to hell, imagine what denying the truth of the faith, not through some deep, uh, insight, suppose it, or misreading of scripture, but denying it because the Baltimore Catechism told you, denying it, worse yet, because, uh, you know, uh, Our Lady of the Quarry <laughs> in Irwindale tells you that uh, all dogs go to heaven. <laughs> Too much time in Irwindale, lady, that's your problem. But no, I mean, that is what basically people will do. They will give their souls away for a song, or less, or less. So, I mean, not not that you'll go to hell for believing that the air is going to be taken away outside and you'll still be able to breathe inside, but it's that sort of mentality, you see what I mean, that'll take the ridiculous over the true. Well, on that curious note, we've reached the halftime. Oh, boy. Are you ready for the halftime show? Do you have your pom-pom? Yep. Okay. Go to it, gang. There's foods and everything. Now, in our second half of, of our third part, second half of our third part, uh, we should say a little something about the new age. I think that'll that'll get everyone happy, and then we'll sum up, and then we'll go to questions for a little while. Okay. New age. N newage. Newage. To rhyme with sewage. Newage. Well, I don't know. I like the new age. You know, I I have a feeling. I mean, like, I, I tend, I'm the kind of person, like, I'm very spiritual. I'm not religious, but I'm like, you know, uh, oh, I don't know how to say this. I've got to be, like, at the one hand, close to the earth. But on the other hand, I feel a need to communicate with the goddess within me. And, I mean, like, I've, I've got these Wiccan friends, and, like... <laughs> Excuse me. Why? I'm just in juice I'm vomiting. Just, I'm getting sick. <laughs> well, I was about to say, I have these Wiccan friends, but they're too dogmatic for my taste. <laughs> so, but I'm afraid we've induced vomiting in Professor Bearsack, ladies and gentlemen, Radio Land. Well, 
Unfortunately, when you do it, uh, when you do it this way, the way I've just done it, of course, it induces laughter. Uh, Except the problem is what you were doing was just all too accurate. Well, yes, that's true because I've heard a lot of people speak this way. Every day and every way I'm getting better and better. Now, the new age, I, I, I know if that's a matter for a vote, I'm going to lose, I realize. But the, uh, in the matter of the new age, it's many, many things to many people, all things to all idiots. But uh, why don't, because everyone's concerned about it, as, I mean, people will call anything new age today, anything at all, you know. If you work in a cubicle and you light a candle, even if it's to a statue of a saint or something, oh, that's so new age. Yeah. It's great you're getting in touch with your spiritual side. Thank you very much. I mean, you can uh, light light incense to Shiva, put out a, a CD of Gregorian chant, get in the lotus position, you know, and it's great. And it's sort of mix and match. It doesn't really mean anything, but you don't know anything about it anyway, and it all makes you feel good. Well, that's well, fun to laugh that's at. That's the key word right there. It makes you feel good. Ah. Oh, the same question but, we asked in the last time. What does it have to do with salvation? Well, in point of fact, we have come a long way from the question of salvation. Remember, religion today is held to have two different points for being. You'll find two different sorts of people, basically, who will call it, consider themselves religious. Those who believe it's to save it to, for salvation to save their souls, whatever that means, however they mean that. Uh, and the other is to make one feel good about oneself. Those are the two differing aims. Now, of course, with almost everybody, if not everybody, to a greater or less degree, those two things are somewhat mixed anyway. I mean, uh, you if, if you really believe that your religion will lead you to save your soul if you practice it faithfully, you can't help but get a little bit of comfort out of that. Though if you get a lot, you ought to worry. <laughs> The, uh, and then the other sort, of course, people feeling good about themselves. Well, somehow or other, everybody feels out of sorts with the universe, if you see what I mean. One of the tangible results of original sin is that everybody has this bit of doubt at the bottom of them all. You know, what's really going to happen to me when I die? Am I a good person? Now, it sounds like an idiotic question to those of us who are Catholics, because we've, you know, we're, we're steeped in a religious culture that's you know, gone into all sorts of detail about these questions. But even as an algebra major will laugh at you when you when you see he sees your difficulty multiplying, so too you've got to be a little bit charitable. For a lot of people, am I a good person? In just those terms is a question that nags them. And without the faith, without revelation, there's no way they can answer that. You see? Now their own ill will may contribute to keeping them away from the revelation that would answer their questions. The bad example of those who have that revelation may contribute to it. But nevertheless, the question remains. Am I a good person? What will become of me when I die? And obviously, part of feeling good about oneself is somehow or other convincing oneself that A, I am a good person, and B, when I croak, all will be well. So you see, while there are two different ends to religion, they are rather connected. Well, to get a, uh, 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 a real hold on the New Age, to try and figure out what it is, because, again, everyone just looks at the, the symptoms, so to speak, and can't understand the thing itself. Uh, you know, I chant. That makes me New Age. What do you chant? Well, I don't know. There's some syllables on it. Great. I've got a mantra. Does anyone remember, was it uh, the party with... Uh, Peter Sellers? Yeah, where they're having that, that party and, and Jeff Goldblum... Yeah, and Jeff Goldblum, you see him, and he's all, all horrified. He's on the phone to somebody else. I forgot my mantra. And he's obviously very overwrought. Well, let's pull back and get a little bit of historical, historical light on all this. What we call the New Age, really, in its, in its roots, does not owe its origin to Eastern religion per se, because most New Agers don't know the first thing about Eastern religions. They like some of the practices, they like the pretty pictures, they like the chants, they like this, they like that. But in truth, they, uh, the trappings of Eastern religion are no more theirs than the trappings of Catholicism that they also pick up. It goes back to a movement in the 19th century called New Thought. 
Now, New Thought has its roots in Transcendentalism. By the way, you've noticed it's over 100 years old, but we still call it New Thought, so you figure it out. But it's not that new. The ultimate, the, the basic belief in New Thought is that reality, physical, material reality, isn't really real. And if you think hard enough, think, think happy thoughts, you can alter the nature of reality around you. In a way, it's sort of like magic. See, well, <laughs> the, the bottom dropped out of the Indonesian r rupaya. He made the world a better place. Well, well, you're, you're the result for the, for the yeah. Asian collapse. Oh, is that what I did? Yeah. <laughs> All that effort had to go somewhere. Okay. But no, so this Do is the basic <laughs> This is a basic thing. New thought. And there were many, many different schools of new thought. It's a very nebulous kind of thing. Uh, they range, of course, from Christian science. Anyone remember Christian science? Well, my you know, you always see First Church of Christ scientist. And my uh, my mother you always used to say when she'd say that she called First Church of Christ astronaut. Which uh, <laughs> She thought they're more spaced out than they are scientific. So. Um, and then there's the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the version that says, reality is whatever I make it. Or reality is whatever I think it is. And, well, you have your reality, I have and mine. I have my reality. That's right. That yeah. may be true for you, but it's not for me, or vice versa. I was having this talk last year with a professor where I work, and I was explaining to him that I believe that there is an absolute. And he said, oh, no, I could never accept there's an absolute. And I said, well, one of us is right and one <laughs> of us is wrong. And he said, oh, no, you have your reality and I have mine. <laughs> and I was just looking at him. You know, something nudged my foot. It was my jaw. It was like, <laughs> how can you be so smart about music and so dumb about anything that's so obvious? Well, yeah. every day and every way, I'm getting better and better. <laughs> But that, that's true, and, and the, the, uh, the use of affirmations, which is big in the New Age, starts with new thought in the last century. And of these, every day in every way I'm getting better and better is the classic example. <laughs> Say that to yourself every day when you get up, go to the mirror. Every day in every way I'm getting better and better. Try not to laugh. <laughs> well, <laughs> see, I'd like to point out the Catholic and Cynic start and end with the same letters. <laughs> See? Visualize peace. Exactly. <laughs> Visualize world peace. Yes, I mean, think uh, think globally. Act lo <laughs> there. <laughs> what it's it like? done. <laughs> what the world like? is now at peace. I know it is because sure. it's my reality in which I'm living. The world is a beautiful place. You're a wonderful man. This is a large audience. These are it's all similarly true. <laughs> but uh, no, I, I mean, you, you, you can, that, that from New Thought, which again has its roots in transcendentalism, which, as you know, is part of the intellectual bedrock of our country. Think of all of the stuff the Horatio Alger story, anybody, you know, with luck and pluck can take himself from nowhere to the sky, anybody can grow up to be president. In this country, this all of this is part of the basic bedrock of our psychology. It's a lie. <laughs> you know, that's a little but it's problem. it's the American dream. It's the American dream. <laughs> it's the American dream is a lie. It's not true. It's like dreaming you've got wings and then waking up and being annoyed when you don't. You know, <laughs> just, Especially when you just jumped out of a plane. Yeah. But, <laughs> Ooh, oh, no. But it, it's uh, exactly right. No, it's, it's uh, unfortunately, Sluggo is realer. <laughs> He's more real. But no, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a big, big part of our national heritage, is this notion. You know, they, they, the, as they say, anybody can grow up to become president. Well, usually that's not true. And when it is true, we get somebody like Bill Clinton. So, I mean, there is anybody. And uh, he sure is president. What are you talking about? He's a storybook president. <laughs> Is that storybook or uh, <laughs> stag book? I don't know. We'll find out on Saturday. <laughs> What's Saturday? Do you know what Saturday is? The Great Warning foretold in Irwindale? Mm -hmm. What? Trial. Oh, the trial? <laughs> on Saturday? At the White House. They're going to have the... At the uh, where? At the White House. Isn't it? At the White House. 
going to have the uh, oh, deposition. Oh, the deposition. No. Right, well, well, that's not a trial. No. Uh, don't scare me. Boy, a trial at the White House. It's going to be in the East Room. Why? Well, never you. I mean, because there's more spiritual power in the East Room than well, in the West Room. See, there's there's another thing from this from this notion of, of of concentrating, think happy thoughts. You get this weird idea of this sort of uh, indistinct spiritual energy. You know, you hear this a lot. Uh, Don Chabot, for instance, is <coughs> if I if I were a, a typical New Thought person, I'd say, well, I take Don as an example. He's an older fellow. He's seen a lot. He's a sage. I can feel his spiritual power, his force. Well, you know, uh, you'll hear this kind of thing, and you don't quite know what it means. Uh, and this, this it, it brings us into another earmark, which new thought was, that one of the big differences between new thought and new age is that new thought was actually, as a rule, except for some of the Eastern philosophies, which kind of bear a glancing relationship, a glancing resemblance to it. New thought philosophies, as a rule, were um, uh, antagonistic to organized religion in general, and to Christianity in particular. Why? Because organized religion, particularly Catholicism, was seen as restricting people's potential, you see, as holding them back with all these old ideas. Instead of letting them free, even the stuff I've said tonight, all right, the, uh, a good new thought person would say, "You say, he's saying that you can't grow up to be president, that you can't be anything you want to be, that you are stuck where you are." Well, there's a downer for you. That is a downer, uh. and, and that that was a major point of contention for them vis-a-vis -vis Christianity. Now, one of the things that some of the more Christian-oriented of them, like Mary Baker Eddy of Christian Science, would do is they would say that Christ, rather than being the Son of God, was a Son of God, by which one means he, was a, he achieved through, again, the power of positive thinking. Remember that phrase? He achieved what all of us can achieve. He's the great exemplar. We can all be crucified. <laughs> Somehow that's not in the program. <laughs> Yes, we could all be misunderstood for three years, kicked on for, th for uh, three days, and uh, spat upon <laughs> for three hours. Yes, well, yeah. no, no, no. Somehow that's not part of the program. But that was how they dealt some of it with the figure of Christ. Uh, Christian Science is one of my particular favorites because, of course, Mary Baker Eddy was from New England, and you know most uh, most religions have a defining moment for Catholicism, of course. It's the uh, crucifixion and the resurrection. That's our definition. For uh, Islam, it's the apparition of St. Gabriel to uh, Muhammad and the hijira, the flight from Mecca. To the Mormons, it's the flight to Utah. All these things are defining moments. Well, uh, for the Methodists, it's the Aldersgate experience where uh, John Wesley will listen to a sermon. He was a Calvinist sort of, kind of, when he was younger. And he listened to a sermon from some Moravians saying that God loved him. Uh, well, not just him, but presumably everyone who wanted to follow him. And he felt strangely warmed by this experience. And that's called the Aldersgate experience, you see. And it's one of the, it's the defining thing for Methodists. Well, for Christian scientists, it's the fall at Lynn. Now, Lynn is a dumpy little town in Massachusetts. The late Father Leonard Feeney was born there. Uh, we had the rather nasty rhyme, Lynn, Lynn, City of Sin. But, uh, Simply because of the rhyme, it's, it's, there's nothing particularly sinful about Lynn, except that its major industry now is insurance fraud. They uh, burn <laughs> factories down and collect it. That's the major source of income. <laughs> One day there won't be much left, you know. But um, so far they're still able to keep the city moving with that, so uh, what power to them. Anyway, uh, the fall at Lynn, Mrs. Eddy was walking along, and she slipped and fell, <laughs> sprayed her ankle. Well, she went home, and having, uh, there was a fellow, a, a, a new thought healer at the time called Phineas T. Quimby. And Phineas T. Quimby, don't laugh at Phineas T. Quimby, he uh, taught, again, healing through positive thinking. Uh, Mary Baker Eddy had been healed of hysteria or something by him at some point. So she used this to heal herself of the fall of Lynn. Now, of course, a lot depends on who you talk to. For some, uh, it was just a sprain, 
you know, and she would have recovered anyway. Uh, for others, you know, it was virtually an amputation. I mean, it all depends on who you're talking to. So, at any rate, that was the famous fall at Lynn. So from there, she wrote her, uh, she completely redid Christianity and wrote a book called Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures, which is a title, it's sort of unfortunate, it's kind of long, it doesn't, it's not quite grammatical, I don't think. Science and Key, Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, <coughs> acrophobia and coin collecting with racing form. Yeah. But <laughs> the, uh, the, I don't know. But the the uh, the strange thing here was that it got very popular, and she she originated the system of Christian Science practitioners. You know that some insurance companies will pay for them and so on. Uh, she founded the Mother Church of Christian Science, which is at One Norway Street in Boston, and it was it was quite an exciting stuff, and they they had a huge popularity. Here's something for you, Lord Lothian, who was the British ambassador to Washington during the war came from an old Catholic recusant family. He apostatized and became a Christian scientist. His family were, I mean, Lothians had gone to the stake for the faith. And here, he'd become a Christian scientist, of all things to apostatize to, Christian science. Well, the end of the Christian science tale is simply that uh, Mary Baker Eddy taught that matter was an illusion and that sin is an acceptance of the illusion. That's what sin means in Christian science, which has always led me to wonder why they eat, but they do. Uh, they believe that death is also an illusion. And uncharitable. No, what? No one dies? No one dies. However, Mary Baker Eddy appeared to. So they to. keep their relatives propped up no, on the enough, table? No, they cremate them. Well, they, well no, I guess they bury some of them. Anyway, they don't care a great deal. They, they do a lot of things that don't make a lot of sense, okay. like eating and <laughs> procreating and all kinds of things. Why, why have children? I don't know. They do. However, what happens? Uh, Mary Baker Eddy dies, apparently, and so they lay her in her tomb in Mount Auburn Cemetery and they bury her with a phone uh, so that when she wakes up, she can call for help. But, unfortunately, in World War II, there was a shortage of those things, and they took the phone out. <laughs> and I have to admit, I've always had visions of her getting up the next day. Where's that phone? <laughs> but, uh, so that's, that's Christian science. Now, Is this any connection with Jimi Hendrix being buried with his guitar? I, I think they had a duet for okay. pho phone bell and guitar. Okay. But, no, the, uh, so that, that was, and, and again, she, too, had a great deal of antagonism toward other religions, in her case, because they had distorted the message of Christ, which she restored. Right. Well, anyway, uh, the New Age is quite different uh, from in that aspect, because while its basic premise is the same, it is, and here's a big $3 word for you, syncretistic. Rather than rejecting the world's religions, it takes whatever you feel is best from all of them, whatever will give you strength and insight. Now, interestingly enough, which well-established denomination <coughs> goes back to the roots of our country is, has, a, has been a very comforting home for New Agers. In fact, the New Age element in this church are one of its more dynamic ones. Can anyone tell me? Not the Archdiocese of L.A., <laughs> the Unitarians. The Unitarians. Because again, all of these things sort of merge at the edges. For very different reasons, the Unitarians are also syncretists. And so the two things sort of come together. But New Agery, while it sounds very foolish and very silly and all that, it is part and parcel of our very culture. There's an element, too, of New Ageism that actually just pray traces itself back through Protestantism in general. Mm -hmm. That is, once you say um, uh, faith alone and scripture alone, and you set yourself up as the sole arbiter of what is true, uh, then you become central in your universe. And it's only a matter of time before you don't need a church, and you don't need a minister, you don't need anybody, you don't need sacraments, obviously, because it's essentially you. Uh, as you go down, as your offspring continue to proliferate 
and the belief in God wanes, what are you left with is a secularized version of I'm the center of the universe. So then you end up in a culture like the United States, which has no religious icons anymore except the flag and a bunch of other weird things. And so uh, the religious impulse is still there in all of us, so you start dreaming it up. And again, since you are the center of the universe, anything you decide must be true. And so you do pick and choose. I mean, the, these New Agers will get holy water from the back of a Catholic church. Mm -hmm. They'll pick up incense from a from an occult shop down on uh, Hollywood Boulevard uh, or the pan pipes, <laughs> get, uh, get some stones to put under their pillow, and then they'll go to an aromatherapy place and get uh, just the right kind of oils to put inside their boiling water canisters to smell up the place just right, and they'll read books about angels. And they, they might get all interested in UFOs and be in touch with the space brothers. Uh, uh, get uh, interest. They board them nightly, <laughs> you know. And, <laughs> and, and, you know, the thing is, uh, uh, late night television is, has changed a lot in the last few years, but it was only like 10 years ago. Uh, the, the, the stations would fill up the wee morning hours with anything they could get, and it was often talk, talk shows. Yeah. And it was... You'd get the, you know, uh, uh, some guy named David Rose or something sitting there interviewing a woman who's boarded a spaceship, you know. And he'll very seriously say, well, our next guest is uh, uh, Pamela Mittmeyer, and she <laughs> boarded a spaceship. And then this, this housewife comes out, and she has a little synthesizer, and she says, these are the songs they taught me. And then she starts doing it. And here's this man on national television listening. <laughs> He's getting paid to be polite. You know. Paid a lot to be polite. <laughs> but the thing is, these people take themselves very seriously. Uh, some of you remember an article I wrote for New Triumph, what was it, a year ago, about a student who came to me and said he was absolutely convinced God had revealed himself to him. And, and he knew, uh, now he knew what his life was all about. And when I tried to pin him down on any specific, there was none. You know, God tells me that God exists. And that God is good, as he's always been reputed to be. And then when I say, well, what do you mean by good? Uh, uh, no, no answer. You know, oh, but now his whole life, he was convinced he's spiritual. He's convinced that he's got a purpose. But I couldn't find out what the purpose was. And it didn't matter that there was no purpose because somehow he knew it. <laughs> me and God. And, of course, he didn't appreciate me butting in and trying to find out what the truth was. You know, uh, so it just... And this is what happens, you see. The whole thing sort of dissipates into... Uh, well, you know, I, I uh, every uh, month I very religiously pick up my... Um, what's it called? The Whole Earth Times. And the Whole Earth... Um, something else. Anyway, a calendar. Calendar. The Times... Uh, the whole of the times, I think, really tremendously bizarre because they've got all sorts of things on herbal healing, on 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 just the most extraordinarily bizarre things. The the uh, uh, the rings at Sedona, uh, planets in alignment, aliens, angels, and, and the 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 uh, advice columnist they've got is really wonderful because of course it's all you know you're becoming ever more and more yourself and and uh, you've got to find out what's right for you and all this so you know I'm having a tr I'm having trouble with my husband should I dump him well is this a growth thing or you know is it a negative energy deal you're just sort of like well that's wonderful I love it I love it and the the editrix of this of this paper is some lady called Abigail ex Catholic uh, and she has a picture of her. She's got sort of blonde hair, and she's got a very forthright look to her. She looks like you know someone you wouldn't mind talking to. And the uh, the uh, uh, she always ends her editorial with "From my heart, Abigail." And you know that's being real is a big part of the new age. You know we've got to get. We've got to get past all this artificiality and into, you know, the things that are real. Gardening, sculpture, <laughs> cooking, music, uh, and really just being people together. I mean, why can't we just, you know, like you and me, Bill, why can't we just be people here together? 
We are people here together. No, but I mean, let's get beyond all that other stuff. Let's let's like just be here in our humanity. We, we are human. Well, yeah, I know, but I, I mean, I, I want to get past all the artificial barriers that like people in society put up. Uh, I'll leave my clothes on. Thank you. <laughs> you see, you you just heard a wonderful example, and you must you must remember never ask them what they mean. <laughs> if you the surest way you could get into trouble with people like this is to say, "What does that mean? What are you saying?" Uh, I, I know. I've done it. <laughs> and it, it, it I, I don't know if any of you have seen Mars Attacks. I may have had reference to this film before, this particular scene, but I, uh, I thought very strongly of the New Age. Uh, when they finally translate the Martians' first broadcast, the chief of staff and the president of the cabinet are sitting around, and they, they play it. It says, some, I, I forget the exact quote, but it's something effective. Uh, uh, the suede shall be gathered in the dark of the moon. <laughs> and you see them all looking around. And the only one of them who has the guts to speak up is Rod Steiger, who plays the chief of staff. And he says, what the hell does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, yeah, what indeed. <laughs> well, that's the kind of impression one gets a lot of the time, talking to new agents. Um, a mutual friend of ours, Steve, said that what he finds so annoying about it is that they go on and on and on about things that people are supposed to know already. You know, like... Uh, you know, we've got to get back to food. You know, and, and it's it's amazing the, the the texture, the depth of food. And the, I mean, yes, fine, thank you very much. But it's this focus, as though it were something new and tremendous, on trivialities. That's yet another hallmark of the new age. <coughs> now, it sounds funny and amusing to us. Why? Because I think everyone in this room has been trained to believe, or believes anyway. That there is an objective truth, an objective reality. And when you say that, all this stuff in comparison becomes ridiculous. And it's easy to see it in the New Agers because they... This was this a dippy. But <laughs> we don't see it in the evangelicals and the fundamentalists who are allies on so many things like pro-life and so on. But what are they really saying? You know, I'm saved. I put my faith in our Savior. I presented my sins to Him at a country altar. And I've been saved. I'll never forget. It's the same thing. I mean, it sounds nicer. We're more used to it. It's using the same language that we're used to. Yeah. <coughs> but it's, it's, uh, it's not... It's not really any different. It's an attitude in which I am the center of my universe. I make up all the rules, not just for my behavior, but for all reality. I tell God what I am willing to do, and he assents. I tell God, first it's I tell God he doesn't transubstantiate. I tell God I don't need him sacramentally. I tell God I don't need his mother. I tell God I don't need the saints. I tell God I don't need baptism. I tell God I don't need confirmation or confession. I won't confess my sins to any man. I only confess to God. That's what I'm telling God. I'm saying, I know. <coughs> There's no difference. And what does this all, all sound similar to? It will be as I say, as I decide. Who does that come to mind? Satan. You betcha, Satan. Because, you see, again, you'll find tons of people who will tell you how satanic the New Age is, and there's a sense in which they are right. Unfortunately, it's the sense in which all false religion is satanic. It's easy to see someone praying to Shiva, or going Wicca, you know, and praying to the goddess and saying, oh, that's satanic. But Billy Graham? But the old-time revival hour? But the Lake Avenue <coughs> Congregational Church? Those are respectable. But Reverend Hambone, who marches against the abortion mill with me? Am I saying that that's satanic too? Of course it is. Anything that is not salvific is satanic. 
even dear canon old, uh, kindly old canon Goodshaw at All Saints Episcopal Church. Isn't that amazing? We don't like to think of that. And yet, here's something worse. Worse than those people are our own clergy when they lead us into heresy. Why? Because they're afar, A, they're desecrating something holy, and B, because we're far likely to believe them. And we ought to believe these other characters, even Canon Goodshaw of all saints. So, you want to come face to face with Satan? Not hard. Anywhere you want to turn, anywhere you want to go, you can find him. Having said all of that, what is the antidote? We've said it before in a thousand different ways, a thousand different times. We'll say it again tonight, we'll say it again tomorrow, we'll say it again in a year. And please God, so long as the both of us still have breath in our bodies, please God, we'll always have the grace to keep saying it. And what is that? The answer to these things is the Catholic faith in itself. What has been defined? What is dogmatic? What is sacramental? There and there only is refuge from Satan. There only. I mean, again, let's get a little into practical application here. If you say that outside the church there is no salvation, we toss that phrase off easily enough. Outside the church, no salvation. Well, we think of it normally as saying, well, I need to be a Catholic by the time I die. Everyone does. Or they'll go to hell. We don't take into account the practical application of that dogma in everyday life. What does that mean? It means outside the church there are only two directions to go. To Satan or away from him. That is to God. That is into the church. That's the only refuge. There is none other. And yet, the devil can come right up to the very edge of the sanctuary and beyond. It's a mystery. Because, you see, the graces that the church gives require your own free will. If you refuse that free will, nothing will help you. God will not break your free will. He'll respect it. He will not make you go along with the program. No, no, no. You have to pray for the graces to accept ever more graces. To try and orient your will to God's will. My will to God's will. And to accept all of the means that he's given us in his church. It's a hard struggle. It's a hard struggle. And the statistics are certainly against us. If you go by statistics. That's why St. Paul says we all have to run the race as though we were the only ones in it. In the end, when we go up to the judgment, it'll just be each of us as individuals. So, that is why, you see, it's precisely because of that realization, which our ancestors had so deeply, that the new thought people at all then thought that we held folk back. Because, if you think about it, it is a tragic vision. Things are bleak. There's a reason why this is called the Veil of Tears. That's not poetry. You think the Hail Holy Queen was just, you know, yeah, well, let's see, weeping and mourning in this uh, uh, old, uh, nice place. No, no, that's not it. Uh, weeping and mourning in this uh, uh, playpen. No, no. Veil of Tears. The Hail Holy Queen really makes no sense in modern thought. That's true. I mean, and, it's it's basically a cry of desperation. Sure. And if you're if you if you're convinced that uh, that God loves you just the way you are, and you're really a nice person, then what possible sense does that prayer make? Which which is why the more that priests and from the pulpit, you know, dish out this kind of stuff, trying to make people feel good, 
they're doing them a great disservice, and they're rendering the, the very prayers at the heart of our faith as meaningless. Also, we've said this before, and it should be repeated, and, and we're just saying it in a different way. There is no essential difference between a Methodist and a Satanist. There is no essential difference. Okay? Satanism will take you to hell. Where will Methodism take you? To hell. So what's the difference? I mean... You know, oh, it may be a relative. Yeah. It may be a neighbor. They know? may be nice people for everyone to tea. They may be people that will stop and give, your, uh, give you a jump start if your car isn't working. You know? But that doesn't change the fact that if they're a Methodist or a Lutheran or a Hindu or a Jew, or a schismatic, or anything that the church has defined as being outside the church, they're going to hell. The one major difference between them and the Satanist is that the Satanist is more intelligent about what he's doing. There's always a chance that any one of the folk we mentioned may have goodwill, and so to that degree you have an obligation to attempt to convert them. And those who have goodwill may very well respond. You would not find this to be the case with the Satanist. But the end is the same. You see, that's the great thing about life. While there's life, there's hope. There are people to be converted, people to be snatched from the jaws of hell. As uh, Dickens wrote in A Christmas Carol, the bed, the, room was, the bed was his own. The room was his own. Best of all, the time was his own to make amends in. And we all of us, ladies and gentlemen, have been lax. That's the thing about the Catholic life. You've never done what you should have done. And yet every day is a chance to try again. A chance to do your duty finally. And if you go to bed having failed again, you pick yourself up the next day and try it once more. And perhaps at the end of your life, the sum total of all of this striving will have been the salvation of at least one other soul, and if one of the souls, and certainly your own.